back to another episode of Massey Ferguson Hey Talk. I'm Matt Freud, Director of Marketing for Massey Ferguson and Heston by Massey Ferguson Hey Equipment. And I'm Jessica Williamson, Livestock and Forage Manager with Agco. We're here to help you get the best hay possible. And this season on Hay Talk, we're diving even deeper, looking into how you can maximize your output, get the most from your equipment, and more. Cutter balers. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to do a deep dive into cutter balers. Um, it's going to be a little bit longer of an episode, I'm sure, because we're both getting excited about uh, cutter balers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but stick around to the end of it, and we're going to talk about some shipping efficiencies and stuff that you can find with cutter balers as well, as well as, of course, all of the other aspects uh, between feeding and uh, maintenance and all that kind of good stuff. So I would have to guess, Jessica, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is probably of all the episodes we've done. This is probably one that's more right up your alley and probably makes you a little bit more excited than other ones. To talk about. Yeah. Cut, yeah, cut definitely. <laughs> yep. Whenever I saw that this was the next one that we were going to film, I, I, I said, Oh boy, this one's going to be a long one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, cutter balers come in many shapes and sizes, right? So you can do uh, round bale cutter balers, square bale color cutter balers and that kind of thing. So, um, and I've noticed in the industry, it's kind of ebbs and tides. So some people will get cutter bales for a couple of years and they'll run for, say, three years or something. And their normal trade cycle, the next time they don't get cutter balers. And what I've found in, in my time uh, at Agco is they have the idea in their head that they're going to sell the material, right, the, the packaged product. They're going to mm-hmm. sell it. And the end user doesn't have to go through as much grinding process in the, with a grinder mixer, for instance, Right. And they're expecting to be able to sell that crop or that those bales uh, at a, a higher price because you're cutting out that huge step because the, the end user is going to save on fuel, uh, labor, and so forth, uh, wear and tear on the tractor, run the grinder mixer. But at the end of the day, maybe they didn't uh, set those contracts up ahead of time. So that's one thing to think about to make sure that your end user is going to give you a premium for that cut bale. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all know that a cut bale is going to be a, a better forage for your herd almost almost all scenarios but uh mm-hmm. so go ahead and get us started here we'll we'll just talk about cut bells in general we don't have to yep. specify round or square at this time but just cut bells length of cut and all that kind of good stuff what information can you give us Sure. Well, Matt, I guess I'm going to throw the ball back to you and have you to talk a little bit about the number of knives that are available in some of our different balers, just to get kind of get me set up so that I can start talking about length of cut and and uh, some of the uh, rumination uh, opportunities that we have. So tell us a little bit about uh, some of the knife options that we have in in our balers. Yeah, so we'll start with round balers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, With round balers, you can um, get them with 17 knives. Obviously, our RB series that comes standard with with, uh, 17 knives. And a lot of operators will end up doing one one of two things, or I should say three things. So they either run no knives, which, uh, you know, for that particular problem, that particular day, they didn't need a knife uh, cut. But some people run eight knives because since there's 17 knives, you can't have eight and eight. So it's nine and eight. So they'll run one knife bank at eight knives. Once those kind of get dull, and you can usually tell the more you bail with a baler, you understand what it sounds like, and it's a little more drag on your tractor, and your tractor's you know uh, pulling down a little bit more. You know those knives are getting a little dull, and you'll switch over to a nine knife bank, and and that works out really good for for most people. So you're sizing that crop, you're getting a little bit of cut in there, um, and then you've got the other people on the other hand that are going to be using the all 17 knives. Uh, and those people are going for that maximum you know, cut and they need to make sure it gets cut. Now, one thing I do want to acknowledge here with any cutter baler, whether it be a round baler or a square baler, or any manufacturer for that matter, as it's pulling that crop across those knives, some of that crop is going to come in lengthwise and it's not going to get cut. So we have to always take that kind of thing into consideration uh, when you do that. But that is one thing to keep in mind when that does happen. Now, you jump over to square balers, uh, you can go 17 knives or 26 knives, depending on how big the baler is. So a 3x3 three three baler is going to have fewer knives than a 3x4 uh, or 4x4 four four baler, right? 
So that's one thing also to think about. Um, and the reason they have that is because the chamber's wider. We've got a lot more material coming through there with a three by four versus a three by three. So in the uh, Eastern United States, where we probably have more of a round baler market, um, one of the, the huge opportunities with having these cutter balers is whenever we can't get in the field for the first cutting at the opportune time. So uh, at least where I am here in the mid-Atlantic region, sometimes first cutting can be pretty challenging uh, in terms of trying to beat the weather. So uh what these cutter balers allow us to do if we've, if we're trying to make dry hay, um, and, uh, uh, the forage has maybe matured a little bit past what's ideal is we can reduce that particle size. So instead of baling a full stem orchard grass or a full stem Timothy, now we can chop that stem up a little bit, increase the surface area, and in turn, what that's going to do is allow that animal to perform better that consumes that forage. So now we're turning what used to be a very poor quality forage into a little bit better quality forage just by reducing the overall uh, length of cut in that. So essentially, it's going to be uh, the same process as, you know, uh, a some sort of TMR mixer or grinding that bale, so to speak, um, just cutting out one step. Yeah. So I have a question for you and, mm -hmm. and you've seen plenty of cut, cut bales be fed mm -hmm. and processed and everything. Have you noticed any difference uh, at the, the end product when it actually gets to the, the mouth of the cow, for instance, between a round bale cutter baler and a square bale cut, cutter baler, or they, the final product ends up being about the same. Yeah, so definitely. So uh, I I talk a lot about round bale silage to producer groups, and one of my main uh, claim to fame with round bale silage is a reduction in overall waste at feeding. And we're going to have the exact same thing here with these uh, uh, cutter baler bales. Um, we're going to have that reduction in length of cut. It's going to increase palatability. They're, they're going to eat more of it. But most of all, they're going to eat more of it because they're going to have more room in their gut to eat more of it. Um, if we have these long stem forages, they're having to chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it, regurgitate it, chew it, chew it, chew it again so that they can reduce that particle size internally. Now we're helping the cows to do that for them. So we are already taking it upon ourselves to reduce that length of cut, which is going to help to improve the overall digestive stability. It's going to re, uh, increase their overall uh, dry matter intake potential, and it's going to increase the overall digestibility. Yeah. One thing I usually use as an example when I'm doing uh, training presentations, whatever it may be, is a glass of ice. If you just have normal big cubes of ice, how many are going to fit in there? Whereas you're talking about surface area with your uh, fermentation and everything else, if you do crushed ice, you can get a lot more material in there. So it's a, it's a very similar process and thought process right there. Um, now, <clears throat> so one thing I saw on YouTube, and this was unsolicited, uh, a gentleman bought one of our RB series uh, round balers, and something I've never seen anybody do before, to be honest with you. Um, and this round bail round bale cutters and stuff is is still, you know, it's been around for years, but it's still just now picking up a real good popularity, in my opinion. And but he was ring feeding uh, dry hay that he had used uh, his RB series cutter baler on. And he used all 17 knives, chopped it up real, real nice and everything, and put it in a, uh, a ring. And he said, you know, he took the mesh off of it and everything, and it uh, didn't fall apart because it's packed in there so tight. That's one thing people sometimes may have a misconception that when you have a cut bale, that when you take the twine off of it or anything else, it's just going to fall apart. But in me instances it's going to stack packed together so tight that's not going to happen but what he found when he was feeding with his uh, ring feeder was his, there was much less loss but he when the cows finally moved away from it there was almost no loss on the ground compared to what he was getting with his full length uh and he was feeding bermuda hay if i'm not mistaken or maybe fescue but uh it's it's very good and smart information that we're learning now i mean you know Farming in, in all aspects, farming, ranching, anything else you're doing, you're learning something new every, every day um, and making the most efficient choices for your for your operation. 
Yeah, yeah. And I want to kind of go off of what you said about bail density, because, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this previously, but this Mm -hmm. is another really great way to increase your bail density, especially in a dry stemmy crop. Um, You know, uh, typically uh, the drier the crop, you know, we might get a little bit of of slipping or maybe not quite, um, you know, as dense of a bale. But by reducing the overall length of cut, this is going to help us to increase our bale density. And previous research has shown that the greater the bale density we can get in our round bale silage, the better the overall quality of that, that hay is going to be or that silage is going to be. So um, they showed that if you're feeding your hay or your silage in a ring feeder, and so you're unwrapping that bale and you're exposing it to oxygen, instantly what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing a degradation of that quality. And eventually it's going to spoil because it's a fermented feed. But the denser that bale was in this research, the longer the overall uh feedability of that crop was before it spoiled. Um, They saw an inverse relationship with uh, acid content and sugar content. So the lower that sugar content gets in a fermented feed, the higher that acid content is going to get, which is a good thing because, you know, proper fermentation is the conversion of our available sugars and our readily available carbohydrates in our feed converting them into acids through anaerobic fermentation. So the lower sugar content and the higher acid content is an indicator of better overall fermentation, uh, lower pH, and uh, just longer shelf life of that bale. And so uh, they saw all of these positive attributes by really increasing that bale density. Yeah, that's good information. And, and, you know, just want to touch on a little bit about manufacturers' recommendations and mm-hmm. requirements that, that you have when you're using a, a baler. So keep in mind, anytime you're using knives, it's going to have more PTO requirements. So whether it be a round baler or a square baler, and the more of those knives that you have engaged at any given time, it's going to take more power, right? So usually on average uh, with a round baler, you're looking at somewhere around 40 to 50 more horsepower requirement just to pull that crop across those knives, regardless of how sharp the knives are. Now, as your knives dull, that's going to increase. <laughs> it's just like we were talking about in one of our prior episodes, having sharp blades on your mower or your mower conditioner is to make sure you know they're sharp. Uh, a lot of people will have a second set of knives that they can pop in uh, once the other ones get dull. Uh, always have a, a, a nice sharp set. but <clears throat> So that's one thing you need to think about. So make sure you've got plenty of horsepower to be able to run how many knives you want to run? Because the worst thing you want to do is go out there with your tractor doesn't have enough horsepower and ends up you know, stalling your tractor. Or you have to disengage the knives and not get the full utilization of that cut around baler or square baler that you purchased. When you jump into the uh, square balers, it's, it's a, you know, the same type of scenario. Um, if you're on a three by four large square with knives engaged, you're going to need another 50 to 60 more horsepower. So keep that in mind. And also with your uh, whatever. Uh, implement whether you use a loader tractor or anything else to move those bells around uh, later. Remember, we were talking about this density thing, so that means probably your weight's going to be much higher. So if you look at a uh, a four by five round bell that's dry, you're going to be somewhere around 1,250 pounds. Uh, You start getting into some silage bells, and it's not hard to get a 2,000 pound four by five bell. So when people start getting into talking about a four by six silage bell, and even five by five or five by six silage bell, that scares me because you're getting into that 3,000 plus pound range uh, on those bales. So you got to make sure that your equipment that you're handling it with can can handle that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so any other thoughts or? Well, that can kind of be where our variable chamber comes into play, right? Mm -hmm. So whether we're doing dry hay versus, you know, versus a higher moisture hay that we're going to ferment for silage, you know, just uh, reduce the overall bale silage based on what it is that, uh, you know, that you're handling equipment 
um, you know, what you're best equipped to handle in terms of bale size. I know that, you know, and it's important also to think about uh, the wetter that forage is that we're talking about for round bale silage, the heavier it's going to be. And, uh, you know, hauling water is expensive. Hauling water is heavy. And so if you have the opportunity to maybe dry that down from a 65% moisture to maybe a 50, 45% moisture, you're still going to be capitalizing on that improved quality with fermentation while reducing some of that bale weight and uh, some of that uh, overall need to haul water. But um, yeah, so Matt, uh, you talked a little bit about the importance of having sharp knives. And uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, if you're thinking about getting a cutter baler, maybe this is something new that, um, you know, you're just looking into about how often or how many bales can you expect to have to switch out those knives? Okay. Yeah. Well, like, like most things, it all depends on your, your mm -hmm. crop material, what you're running across there and and how uh, how much other additional debris you may be running through there or not, yep. but uh, usually you can get about anywhere from uh, you know 250 bales. Uh, you can go a little bit higher than that, obviously, um, if you've got a, a nice crop. And I will say this: uh, from what I've found is the if you're doing a silage crop, a true silage crop, and it, and it's wet at that 50 to 55 percent moisture range, you can get more bales through there. Mm -hmm. um, when you start getting the more drier material. It's going to be a lot more coarse and it's going to wear your blades out faster. Now, our blades that we have on our large squares and our round balers are serrated on one side. So they are, they do have the ability to be sharpened, right? So you sharpen them on the other side, obviously, uh, but they do a really good job and they hold up for, for many, uh, many years of you know crop material. And like mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, it's always a great idea to have a second set. And all of our machinery has a, a rack on the machine where you can hold a second set. So if you're out in the field and you have used all your knives up and they're nice and dull, you can swap them out very easily. So with our large squares, we have a tray. It pulls out and you can just pop the new ones in real easy. With the round baler, of course, you put them in from the, uh, the back side of the baler. Um, there's one lever that you flip over and it you know takes out the holder and then you can pop them in and out real easy. But that's usually about how many bells you can get out of it. Like I said, it can vary up and down depending on uh, – what material you're running through there. Yeah. And uh, like we touched on at the beginning, like Matt talked about making sure that if you are uh, utilizing these knives to reduce your length of cut and, you know, you're going to be putting more input into making each bale. So if you're marketing your hay, make sure that you're getting a premium for that uh, so that you can ensure that you're getting your monies back for the additional inputs that you have. Um, likewise, if you're feeding your own livestock and you are reducing the length of cut to improve performance with the goal of improving performance, uh, make sure that you're doing that in a worthwhile manner. Um, you know, if you're in third cutting a very fine grass, like maybe a really high quality um, uh, endophyte free or novel endophyte fescue, and you're in third cutting and it's fine, it's uh, very palatable, maybe engaging the knives at that point would not pay off because at that point you're going to be introducing much more horsepower usage, much more fuel usage, and probably not a lot of payoff for an improvement on forage quality that's all, that's already extremely high. So make sure that you're utilizing these in a way that is paying off for your operation and for your um, overall uh, hay making goals. Yeah. Well, my last thing I'm going to say is just make sure you look at your inputs. You were talking about the input costs and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things you need to take into consideration before you take the step in starting running a uh, cutter baler. So the first uh, input cost is going to be the cost. Uh, so the cost of a, a baler, because there are other mechanisms besides just knives in there. Of course, you have to have a rotor that's going to pull that crop across those knives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got extra drives and that kind of stuff. So the overall baler is going to cost more. So make sure you, you know, look at that first of all. Uh, secondarily, you're talking about the drag on the tractor and the, the extra horsepower requirement. You're going to need a larger tractor usually. Um, and also look at fuel consumption. You're going to have more fuel consumption. So whether it's because you went to a larger tractor or your tractor is having to work harder to cut that crop, 
Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, additionally, you're going to have more density in the bales. So I don't know how you're transporting it from point A to point B or selling it. Another thing to think about, right? So you're going to have uh, more transportation costs when it gets from point A to point B. <clears throat> now, at the end of the day, like Jessica said, it's going to pay off most of the time. Uh, you're going to have a lot more digestible crop and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica, for joining us again on Massey Ferguson Hay Talk. Thanks. This was, of course, Cutter Balers. We talked about Ram Balers and Large Square Balers. Uh, and join us next episode, which will be our final episode of Season 2. Mm -hmm. And that one is we're going to talk about uh, double conditioners. And the main focus is going to be about triple windrow attachments and the efficiencies that are followed by that. So look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of Massey Ferguson Hay Talk.